Hello guys and welcome back to the podcast. It's been a minute and today I am joined by Laidlaw. We thought it'd be good to catch up before our back-to-back on New Year's Day. You and me will be taking to New Century Hall where we'll play for three and a half hours. Dungeon Meat will be joining us, Mother Earth and Local Dub. In today's conversation, we talk about some hot topics which are going around Twitter at the moment, some TikTok uh, opinions and all sorts. Yeah, we took some questions from you guys. Some of them were very, very good which you will hear shortly. And in general, it was great to have a chat. And just a reminder that today's podcast is sponsored by the Syntho app. We recently launched after nearly 18 months of development. And if you're an aspiring producer or someone who's just stuck in a rut, Syntho is the place to check out. If you want any more information on it, just get in touch with me direct. There'll be links below. But anyway, let's get straight into this podcast. So can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. It's good to chat again, bro. How was Fuse at the weekend? Yes, mate. Um, you know what? It was so good, man. Probably one of the best ones to date. For, um, just for the way the, the night flowed, you know, that from lineups to the actual music itself to the people there, everything was just spot on, man. I mean, it's, when you've got two of the best, you know, things coming up, Fuse and Fabric in London, there's not that much can go wrong with the amount of work that goes in behind closed doors, man. Yeah, I was impressed to hear from you on the Tuesday. I knew we had this penciled in. And like, if it's me, honestly, I can't even think about talking to anyone for a, a good few days. So what was your plan of attack in terms of um, partying slash playing? Because I know your you set began at like, was it five or was it nine or something like that? Yeah, so I was playing at half nine. Um, and I looked at the lineup before and I thought, well, I could technically go at the beginning because it was going to be good music from start to finish, you know? You know, sometimes you get to a party and... Maybe you're not feeling the, the the set before or whatever, and the time kind of drags on. With that, I knew it was just going to be be all right. But I thought, let me be smart, because not only do I need to, if I not only do I need to wait X amount of hours for my set. Once my set finishes, there's still another almost 24 hours, you know. Um, so what I ended up doing, it was my birthday as well on the Saturday, so we went out for some food and some drinks and watched the match. Um, then it got to about. I think it was about one o'clock, one a.m., and I was like, "Right, this is either where I start partying or <laughs> I lay my head down." And I actually, I actually went. I brought loads of people back to mine, and I was like, "You look and crack on. I'm gonna have a little nap." And then me, I live with Zach as well, uh, and me and Zach both had a nap because he was working. So, and we got up about three o'clock, half three, I think it was, and then we got there for about four, half four. So. Not too bad. Tactical masterclass then. Yeah. <laughs> Good on you. And what time do you stay till? Uh so I stayed till about six PM. I actually I actually could have gone the full way, but what the all my mates that I went with, they was all hassling me, right? Saying you need to come back to this you need uh, we, we always normally go back to our friend Jack's house and have a mix after every every party that normally every time there's a good weekend we go to Jack's loft, you know, we're spinning records for days. Time doesn't exist. It's one of them ones. And um, they kept messaging me saying, when you coming back, when you coming back? And I was thinking, what's going on? And when I got back, they had all these balloons and that set up. Um, and then we carried on there to about early hours of Monday morning. And I was trying to call an Uber home, thinking like <laughs> every Uber was cancelling for about 45 minutes because of the snow. Um, and we were sitting there laughing, thinking people are going to come outside of fabric now. <laughs> And it's just going to be white everywhere. And they're going to think, how long have we been in here for? <laughs> yeah, I saw that all over Twitter. People were uh, shocked. And also there was the trains, weren't there as well? So I don't think people could actually get home after the uh, after the rave. Yeah, no, exactly. I was reviewing still and his flight got cancelled from Berlin. Every, all my mates that were playing in Berlin this week and they couldn't get back. And it was just, yeah, but, you know, mother, when Mother Nature calls, you can't stop it. I know, and I'm surprised you've um, managed to turn around so quickly. But I find that when the rave's that good, the hangover doesn't exist. You know, and it's when it's actually worth it, and it's not one of those that you've you know got um, got out of it for the sake of it. I think then I can just brush the hangover off and crack on. No, that's it. You know, like, that's and the older I get, and the more the more I do things with the right intentions, I find I always receive the right results the next day. You know, like. When I used to go like, there, there was a time, say, where I'd be going out and the, the, the motive would probably be going out to get lost, you know, maybe there's loads of things going on in my life. And, you know, there was a point in time where I might have gone out raving just to kind of escape, as you called it, you know. Uh, whereas as you kind of grow grow and you learn, you know, 
you you learn that the intentions for going out are so pure that the next day when you wake up you're just full of you know full of good memories and you actually gives you the, the the you know the power to carry on rather than think oh my god what did i do this weekend <laughs> yeah i can totally relate we did it after um when i played mint where else and it was like every second of that was 100 percent worth it when's the next one <laughs> whereas you know <laughs> there's been them times i think it is actually get older i think i think as well like we were pretty fucked up but i was like to mates man there might only be 10 more times in our life us four party together you don't know how many more times you're gonna party but obviously really- hopefully there's many more times but yeah it's um there will be that time. Well, I've seen someone say it before. There was that last time you ever played out with your friends in the park, but you never knew it was the last time. And at, at some point, there's going to be the last time you rave with a certain person. So yeah, Very all true. listeners go out this weekend. <laughs> um, so today's um, podcast, we've obviously got New Year's Day coming up. Well, we've played back to back at New Century Hall. Mm-hmm. Have you seen the pictures of the venue and all the videos have been posted? Oh, mate, it looks incredible. Has there been events there before in the past? So it is a 1980s venue, which has had the likes of Jimi Hendrix. They had the 808 State there, um, a guy called Gerald. And I believe it was shut for about 20 years. My dad was like, oh, yeah, I saw Tom Jones there. I was like, fucking hell. So, (laughs) yeah, it's been shut for about 20 years. I don't have a clue um, what was going on with the building, but it's a listed building. So they've still got the sprung dance floor. They had the Guinness World Record. Guinness World Book of Records for the longest ashtray in the world, as it's like all the way down the side, which obviously wow. you can't smoke now. But yeah, they've turned into this, this massive room, which um, honestly it's it's pretty uh, overwhelming when you see it for the first time. It's huge. It kind of reminds me of what did someone say the other day? Oh, someone gave me a really good um, kind of comparison. But yeah, the uh, the dance hall. What's interesting is we plan to do the. Firstly, you've heard about this. We were doing the decks on the floor, but originally we wanted to do the turntables on the floor, but mm-hmm. we did all this testing. And as they've started doing more parties again, as it only opened about six months ago, they found because it's a sprung dance floor, it's already starting to bounce even more. So when you stood that on the floor, you can almost feel this um, wow. this movement. So the compromise we're going to have to make for the records turntables is that we can do the decks on the floor with people around us. But mm-hmm. I think with enough time to prepare, I think it's a good compromise because... You'll agree, I think, with, when it's our sound, when you've got it on a stage, you can feel quite disjointed. And, you know, when you go to these massive room raves, sometimes it doesn't translate that well. So I think it's something that we've decided on, which ultimately is a bad decision for the party in general. But, yeah, I think it's going to be a unforgettable one, to say the least. No, nah, 100%, man. And you're so right as well. The choice between playing records but be disconnected or be connected that you know without the records it's 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 a no-brainer for me man it's all about that connection yeah so i've got um loads of cool topics and questions today some controversial ones some quick fire ones i'm going to go for the first one and it is well i got loads of these what are our opinions of phones in the rave i think there's been quite a lot again recently there seems to be an ongoing kind of cycle of um people moaning about phones and then obviously the the rise of TikTok, etc. There's more videos than ever. All of this, and I've seen a few quite um, opinionated posts from people recently. I know what I think of it, but what is your stance on this? Um, phones out on the dance floor and all this. <laughs> right. So I, I'm I'm quite lucky in the sense of like, and I think you're similar age to me, where when we first start going out, phones weren't good enough to take videos that were even worth uploading. So like, I've done the Raven without the phones, you know, and for me, I. I had an amazing time. And because of that, when I go to a party now, I won't pull my phone out every time there's like a track that I like to record it. Sometimes they're even my own tracks are playing and I'm like, I want to record this, but I'm just want to enjoy the moment, you know? And what, what you, it's like when you go to see, the best way to describe it is like when you watch a sunset, you know, and you're like, oh my God, look at that sunset. And you're just so immersed in the sunset and you try to take a video on your phone and it's just not cutting it. You know, you look it back, you, there's no feeling there. And I think what you disconnect from by videoing all the time is you disconnect from the feeling, you know, and you're you're kind of engrossed. But at the same time, I for me, I it doesn't bother me in that sense, you know, because if that's what you like to do and that's how you enjoy your night, then do it. I'm I'm not here to what but what I don't like is is like for example, I'm not a fan of filming for um 
for anything else other than your good memories. You know, don't film at other people's speedo gate. <laughs> you know, he's a... <laughs> seen, yeah. I, I, I was going to mention this, but yeah, you, are you thinking about the same recent incident with the fabric? I I'm mean, look, that that is a, that's a very touchy subject. That I mean, look, that point blank. You know, like it's out of order. Yeah. The I don't know, I don't want to get into too much details about that, but let's let's just ha- let's just put it straight. Like, no, and number one, like I don't care what your opinions. The, op- the only opinions that people should be listening to on this are the people that are making and playing the music that you're going out and dancing to, because like none of us agree with it, you know. And if it wasn't for the people making the music, putting on the parties, you know, a- anyone that's basically involved in creating this event. I can pretty much guarantee that 99% of them, if not 100, will be totally against anything to do with discrimination, anything to do with, you know, like equality. Like it's all about, you know, everyone expressing, being themselves. That's the whole point of our party, you know, is about being, be yourself, to be yourself, to express yourself, to, and without the fear of judgment from others. That's why you go out, you know? So, if you're going to pull your phone out to take the piss out of someone, unfortunately, you're in the wrong place, mate. You know? Yeah, I think as well, I think it's easy to make a comment and later realise you're actually wrong, but kind of keep going and digging the hole deeper. You know, recently I put a tweet out after a party and it wasn't anything similar to this, but I shouldn't have put the tweet. I deleted it and said, sorry, I shouldn't have put that tweet, mm-hmm. you know? And sometimes, you know, just realising, okay, I shouldn't have said that, take the lesson from it. And I mean, no one actually had a bad intention really with the thing. You kind of think that this person who was getting the piss taken out of doesn't actually exist. They're a real person and they probably will have seen it on Twitter. You know, the world's such a small place. And I think it's really easy to say things online and forget that there's someone actually behind the message you're saying that's going to see it or read it or take offense. But yeah, I think it was um, something which was quite controversial, but there was quite a big line down the middle of the people who were like, it's not acceptable. But I think the ones that didn't quite get the people you know, like our side of the argument saying you can't do that in a club. This isn't a place that discrimination should take place and all this kind of stuff. I don't think people quite got the point that it was like, this is the discrimination is the point here. It's not the fact he was wearing speedos, etc. Yeah. It's like, you can't do that. Yeah, it's like, where space. would you run? I'm sure anyone that's yeah. against that, it's just probably because they haven't got the bollocks to do that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I ain't got the bollocks going in the middle of the club wear speedos. Yeah. You know? well, I, yeah. Yeah. I put the same thing. Like if my, if, if my, yeah, I said, if my friend did that, I'd probably take him home because like, it's not something we do, but you know, it's, it's each to their own. And I think it just comes from inexperience of what you're actually part of or what you think you're part of. You know, it comes from, you know, when you, when you research back into what raves are, you know, it, it's like, it's all about this freedom of expression, you know? Okay. You, this controlled and fucking, you know, disciplined, you regimented system. Oh no, I don't want to be part of that. I want to, you know, I want to be something different. That that's like the birth, you know? So like when, like a lot, what I find is a lot of the younger generation, especially in, in the UK, but right, I find that in the UK, the age range of people that go out are so, so, is very young, you know, which is an, is an amazing thing in a sense, you know, it means like from young, they're being exposed to music, which is a, a lot better than what you hear on a commercial radio station, you know, which is great. But it's like what I think is missing is people that are actually communicating about what what is actually happening here, because you know it's all it's all well and good going to a rave and and just thinking that it's just a rave and taking a rave and taking music as well for granted. But like the people that make the music, the people that put on the parties, you know, the people that are doing this for the right reasons, that I think there should be more of a voice from them. Like I, like that's why I respect you so much for doing things like this, you know, because. This allows people to actually listen to people that are, you know, have been doing this for a little while now. And, you know, it's like we've, it's it's not that we know everything. It's that we've learned from the people, like I've learned loads of stuff from the people that I look up to, you know, when I was going out 10 years ago, you know, when I used to go to Fuse and, you know, take like, you know, 20 pills in a night and fucking, you know, probably couldn't even see in front of my face. And, but like, I, I was quite lucky that when I first started going out, I went out with people that were a lot older than me, you know? So I learned very quickly what this raving culture is about, you know? And I feel like nowadays there's so much, like people see a lot, but they don't really see an insight. They they just see little snippets, you know? They see little stories. They see these 15 minute second videos. They, 
And it they what they do is instead of getting the real thing, they just get this assumption, you know, and they assume that something is like this. Yeah, I, I agree, man. And honestly, like anyone that did tweet and probably look back now and think, okay, yeah, maybe I was wrong to be taking the piss. I've got no problem with them. It's all about learning. And I think there should also be a space online to be able to say stuff and go, right, I was wrong. I'm sorry. And not this cancel culture, you know? And sometimes I think things sometimes and I'm like, hmm, I would really like to share this opinion, but is it too close to this? Is it too close to that? Will I get canceled? But I think there should be a bit more, you know, openness to being able to say things. And if you get it wrong, someone says, oh, you know what? This is the fact or here is this or, you know, no, actually this was the case. Then I think it would make it a better space. But... I just saw it. This week has been yeah. carnage on Twitter. Carnage yeah. with the, the topics. There was all yeah. sorts. And it, it's funny because it's like a place, if anyone's not on Twitter right now, it seems to be a, a real fast-growing um, kind of forum for the, the hot topics in electronic music. Some Most of it's for the good, but there obviously is this kind of small bit of um, controversy. But yeah, I think there should be a place for people to get things wrong as well and, yeah. and not feel ashamed and be held. If someone's got the opinion, you know, they made the wrong comment on this situation this week, they should be allowed to go, okay, right, whatever it's done and not have this lingering over them forever as well. No, you know, you're 100% right. You know, I think what, you know, that, that side of the subject is like, that is one of the most powerful things you can do is actually turn around and be like, you know what, I was wrong. You know, like I weren't thinking straight because we've all been there. You know, we've all we have, we have. done shit that we shouldn't have done and that we've learned from. And if we, and I think what that stops you from the power you get from forgiveness and also, you know, growth you can get from that is incredible, you know, and that's what it's all about. You know, it goes back to the whole point of this whole togetherness and, you know, expressing like if someone isn't able to turn around and be like, you know what, I was wrong and people ain't able to forgive them that. That's exactly the same. Everyone deserves a second chance. The whole council coach thing is crazy. It is crazy. And just the final point on that, the people that seem to get offended a lot of the time about certain comments are usually the people that aren't actually related to the comment, you know, where it's this kind of, say, a comment gets made towards this group, that group. A lot of the time, the ones getting offended aren't even part of that group and they're speaking on behalf of them. I mean, that's a big thing that's, you know, that I hear a lot of people talking about recently. But mm -hmm. anyway, the next point uh, we've got is the tick talk tech house scene this kind of links to this it's a very interesting one because we're both dabbling on tiktok i've seen you do a few posts mm -hmm. i have i can't quite decide if it's good if it's bad coming back to what you said about the age thing what's great about tiktok is it's filtering in a massive wave of young ravers mm -hmm. the massive pro there is this is going to give a lot of longevity longevity to clubs and club nights like ours because they're gonna be raving for the next 10 12 years without them kids it's almost like an extinction you know if you're just purely relying on older ravers they go out less and less as they get older so it's an interesting one as there's definitely a huge amount of people which will naturally go to raves because they see it on tiktok and not necessarily go to the rave because it's the rave but do we need these people in the space to make the numbers up or do you think it's going to be a net negative what's your general opinion on the the whole tiktok thing i mean look you know i think the way i looked at it is there was there was a point in my life where i think i think it would have been about 2009 or something like this i mean i was in like year seven or eight in school and i remember i was trying to tell my mum about facebook and she was laughing at she was like what what's this you know and I kind of had that same thought with tiktok but it was the other way around where i was the person <laughs> being like <laughs> What's this? And then I, I literally fought back to that to that very same moment where I told my mum that. And it kind of hit me. And I was like, mate, if I, you know, like there was a point where, for example, there was a lot of DJs when Instagram came about, you know, big DJs that didn't bother with social media. And what happened is their career, you know, and their reach and, you know, uh, went kind of down, you know, it faded away. And I think what... The way I look at TikTok, it's just another platform, you know. Yeah, there might be a lot of, you know, younger people on there, but like there's a there's a stigma with say TikTok, which is this it's only there for certain things or certain people. Whereas really, you know, everyone it's is just on a it. A platform. And it's up yeah. to you what you put there. You, why don't you be the pioneer on that platform? You show people a bet if you think that what people are doing is not cool on there, then why don't you get on there and make something cool? 
and yeah. be that pioneer and let the people follow you and, and follow your method instead of sitting and pointing fingers and being like, I'm not going to... That's my attitude with it. And it's, you know, it's funny. It was a similar thing I had with Beatport as well. Because when we first started BU, we was like, we're never going to go to Beatport. You know, it's just full of that music that we don't like. And, you know, the top 10 is always shy and this. And then again, a brainwave hit me. It's like, hold on a minute, Reese. Instead of just sitting there and keep being like, oh, the top 10 in Beatport shit, why don't you actually make it better if you think you're that good? You know, if you if you think that your music, you know, so much better or you think this is, or this is so bad, then prove it. And then that was, and then my attitude flipped with that as well, you know? Yeah, and it's it's been able to go back on your own. You know, you've said in the past, okay, Beatport shit, but being able to go back and say, you know what, I was wrong. I've said it as well. It was like, okay, now I've, I'm potentially considering, well, I know you guys do it, doing some just digital releases as well, where it was like, okay, all has to be vinyl, all has to be this, all has to be that. But it's like, wait a sec, by doing that, it's slowing down the process of putting music out there. That means less people can hear it. And then it's, with vinyl, you're pressing 300 copies. So you're essentially prioritizing 300 people versus potentially tens or hundreds of thousands of people that can stream it or listen on Beatport. So it's a very interesting one because it's almost like, to be more inclusive, you should actually be on um, digital. So yeah, I'm very much with you where recently I've had a brainwave. I'm just like, wait a sec. There is a huge um, percentage of people which don't, man, I know barely anyone that buys records. <laughs> and even when I think about my own tunes, I don't know many people who have come up to me and gone, oh, I discovered you through the record or bought the vinyl. Unfortunately, even though I wish I ha they had, I've not actually encountered that many people that bought my records because there is only 300 ever pressed. That mm -hmm. is such a small amount of people compared to, that's not even the amount of people that come to a one you and me party. So yeah, I think the same here. We've shifted our opinion and shifted our strategy slightly. We're still not sure. I think the whole label space is a really weird one. But I do think going forward, we've always done Beatport when we started doing digital. But yeah, I think it's a massive place to not be um, putting in music. Yeah, you know, and I think, like you said, it, it just goes down to as if it's a pla if it's a platform where there is, you know, a lot of users. I think it's you're only holding yourself back, you know, not using it, whether it's TikTok, whether it's Beatport, Bandcamp, whatever it is. It's like just just get it out there, man. You know, like there's always even if even if getting your stuff on Beatport makes only one more person hear it, that's one more person that wouldn't have heard it. You know, it's like it's all about it's all about being able to to reach out to as much people as possible with the good product that you've had, you know, cause you've, you know, if it's, let's say for example, you spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours mixing and practicing your mixes, you know, you've gone out, someone's recorded, like the club has recorded a really nice video of you, you know, and it's showing off, all, showing all the hard work that you've put in, you know, for X amount of time. And you'll sit there like, should I upload this to TikTok and show people? Or should I just, you know, not upload it at all or should yeah. i spend i spent i spent the last five years say practicing my music should i only allow this to be shown to 300 people you know or should my work get the the credit it deserves you know yeah i know maybe a bit of a controversial one but i know with a lot of the people who are kind of anti-instagram or anti-tiktok etc whenever i've met them they're on the phones on instagram the whole time <laughs> I'm just like, wait a sec. I thought you didn't use this stuff. And they're on it. I can see them scrolling. But they're essentially just being consumers and not creators. Yeah. And I was trying to use the angle of like every single day, I want my social media usage to be on the side of being a creator, which is why I do the YouTube, the podcast, the education stuff. It allows me to stay on the side of providing things to this system opposed to just consuming it. I do consume a fucking lot of it. Don't get me wrong. But I think you can try and shift it to be positive things, you know, inspiration, education, and then entertainment doesn't always have to be um, toxic stuff, but uh, yeah, so uh, I think we've we've covered a good good amount of ground there. But the TikTok thing, I think, it is what it is. I think this is just going to be. It's nothing new either, you know. Yeah. Once upon a time, Facebook would have been where all the young ravers were. Instagram would have been where all the young ravers were. It's just now there's this viral video thing, which is, seems a bit different. But I don't think it's anything out of the ordinary. It's just the cycle um, packaged in a different branding. Exactly that, you know. It's just learning learning to adapt. Yep. So the next one is quite a good one. We kind of touched on this. So when I said this was from Twitter, UK scene compared to different cultures you have played for. Your after Cabasida experiences as you're both risen to become household names at events. So I guess this is a question is 
what do we think of the UK scene compared to different cultures? I know we just touched on it briefly. I mean, my UK scene is probably my, well, I, say, I might say it's my least favourite, but it's not. You know, I, I like everything for it. I like the fact that the UK scene is very young, you know, and again, it just means that people are educated from, from, from a younger age, you know, if they go to the right places. But uh, I feel like with the UK, they've got this very, like, it's my rave and these are my friends and this is my music and these are my clothes. Do you know what I mean? It's a, it's a big, 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 like, it's not, as not, not with everyone, you know, it, there, there's a lot of ego in the UK raving culture. Let's put it that way, you know, and ego is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it's like your ego is what drives you to push forward sometimes, you know, it, like person that has no ego is there's no drive. You know, you, you need that balance. You need to be able to, get your ego, put him on the lead and be able to take him a walk, not let him walk you, you know? But I feel like with the UK culture scene, there's a, a big ego and it comes from, again, it comes from misunderstanding of the culture, you know, because it, it not only, it's not just, um, it, it spirals down from how the country is. Like, you know, you go to other countries, you go to Switzerland, you go to Amsterdam, you go to Berlin. These countries actually care about the music culture you know, they help the clubs, they they, they educate uh, and they invest and they fund a lot of projects, you know, and they really care about the culture and the art, not just music, art and in general. And I think what that does, it spirals down to, you know, to the younger generation and it, and it, it, it you know, they're, they're going out cultured, you know, whereas a lot of the UK industry, it's like, it's like we try and fight against culture and we think it's a bad thing but you know uh what i find is a lot of people go out um here and it's all about them you know it's not about us and that's that's why i prefer raving in europe than raving in uh like for example you go to after capacity there's no phones in the air it's hands and whistles you know people are there to dance and express because people don't realize how healthy dancing is like literally forget drugs you know why don't I, I i would love some some people from the uk to go out one day and not take any drugs and just go out and dance and people think they can't do it but believe me it's fucking well easy to do you know and it's, it's a lot easier than you think you know and i'm not i'm not even someone that's like anti-drugs or nothing like that for me it, it's um um, and the reason why I'm even talking about drugs is because, again, I think that is part of why the UK culture is what it is, because so many people think going out is taking drugs. You know, they think that if I go to a rave, a, ra a rave is somewhere where people go to take drugs, which is complete bullshit. You know, a rave is somewhere where you go to dance and listen to amplified vibrations that are coming out of a speaker you know, and then vibrations are, are making you move your body, which is making you release serotonin, which is making you happier, you know, which is making you express, which is making you release things, what you need, you know, and I think that's forgotten about, you know, in this, U in like UK, I say UK because I notice it more in the, I'm not generalizing the UK, there's many, many mates that I have and, you know, that I have in UK that, that think, especially older as well, but this whole younger generation, they, and again, I don't think it's no one's fault. It's just purely because no one's here saying it. Do you think some of it comes from the way that the government don't allow for clubs to be open so late and there's now a massive shift towards day parties and in general, people are having to drink more and consume more in a shorter period of time. And because of that, the focus gets shifted away from the music and almost like, right, okay, mm -hmm. we're going to get absolutely fucked up because we've only got until you know, 3 a.m. in some places, 4 a.m., whereas in other cities, they've got a lot of choice, a lot of options. Could even I say... I wouldn't necessarily say that specifically, but that, again, is, you know, part of the problem in the sense of the the, the not accepting the culture. You know, that that's just... It's very easy to say, like, uh, it's because of this or because of that, but, you know, you could say to yourself, well, you know, I think it's purely... It, it, it spirals down from, you know not being educated on 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 culture rather than all people see like especially for a younger generation nine, nine times out of ten to sell a party people are just showing flashing lights you know and 
and people dancing and, and music and clubs and drinks in their hands and this. So people assume that that is what you go out for. So my question then would be is for people listening that want to make a conscious effort to, you know, do their bit to improve the rave culture in the UK. What do you think are some actionable steps people can take to, you know, try and improve the environment of their local party scene or when they're going out with friends? I'd say do some research into the history of, of rave and the history of house and the history of music in general, you know, where it spirals from. Uh, dig deep, you know, okay, you got you like you like house music, you know, where does house music come from? You know, then where does that music come from? Then where does that music come from? And actually like research into what you're actually doing because you know it's it's very easy to just see the product and not understand the process. And it's it's something we're all guilty of in all angles, you know? Yeah, I, I do agree. So the next thing we have got on the topics, we'll try and keep this on a bit shorter, is the door policies. And I think this links to the TikTok thing of, you know, the wrong people going to the wrong places. I know in maybe five years ago, even places like Fuse had things like this. Sankey's did in Manchester. Um, I believe Fabric does still a bit. But what do you think that it's, it's, it's a hard one? What do you think on door policies? Uh, I'm a fan of door policies in a sense, but it, it just depends on what the policies are. You know, for me, I think if if there's a certain, um, you know, range of, and I wouldn't even say it's age-based, you know, it, it's more experience-based, you know. Let's say, for example, 90% of the crowd or, you know, the average of your crowd is a very experienced crowd. I think there should be a door policy where you don't let too much people that's on the complete opposite side of the experience, you know, ladder in the party yet. You know, because even like, for, for example, the first three times I went to Fuse, I didn't get in. You know, I got turned away the first three times. Why? Because I was this little shitbag raver, you know, probably turned up after being up for three days, you know, with a little bit of an attitude, you know, thinking that I was the bollocks because I just found this new music with all my new mates, you know. And there's this little me with this big ego trying to get to the door. And then someone's telling me I can't get in. I'm like, what? What do you mean? Well, I can't get in. That the best part in London, I can't get in. I was like, you know, but then obviously then what that I then instead of being like, oh fuck that, they're not letting me in, it was like, oh, why are they not letting me in? You know, and you start to realise and you look around, you're like, everyone in here is a lot older than me. Like, what? I'm used to going to these raves where everyone's my age, you know, and I'm like, oh, what's so what's so interesting about this party, you know? And then and obviously that then educated me in a sense of, you know, there's more to it than just turning up and getting fucked. I'm a big fan of making sure that the vibe of the party is right. And I feel like if someone if someone doesn't understand what and why they're going somewhere, then they shouldn't they sh they're not ready to go there. It's not a case of you can't come in and you never can, it's you're not ready, you know? And you know, and I think by doing it that way, that is what allows you to grow, you know, and educate yourself throughout the whole time going out. Not only does it create a better vibe it also creates a safer space you know it it allows incidents like that what happened in fabric to not happen because anyone in that party wouldn't even think to do something like that you know so to and when i say do something like that and what i mean is to do something which is uh like entertainment which is um belittle in someone else you know yeah, in um, Sankey's back in the day in Manchester, when I was 16, 17, I got a fake ID off a friend for a birthday. And to go to Sankey's back then, he had an older brother. People dressed a certain way. So it was a thing where like, you had to wear the right clothes, the right shoes. So it was, it was the area when people used to like have their skinny jeans and rolled up at the bottom with some Air Max ones on. And there was a shop in Manchester called Menic Matty. So people used to go and buy the t-shirts from there. It was a certain style. And it was almost like you had to dress like that to try and get in. But it wasn't a thing that was like, oh, that's not right. It kind of felt like a raving uniform at the time. You know, people used to wear an Ibiza and all that. But it felt really normal now, uh, normal then. So it was almost like if someone turned up and they were, you know, in, say, they were in cargos and they were in a quarter zip. Like, and it was another controversial one, but they wouldn't have got in. But it wasn't seen as a weird thing back then. But I don't know if it's because now there's so many different trends and fashion things. It's kind of hard to spot people. There's not really like a rave uniform. I know it sounds mad, but everyone dresses really different now and there's lots of different fashions and all sorts. So I don't think it's as easy to kind of tell a raver from a non-raver these days. Um, but yeah, I do think to a degree, um, door picking is good. I went to Berlin and I didn't get in the Bergheim shock. And then I know I didn't get in Hoppatos. He was like, who's on? 
I was like, to be honest, mate, I don't actually know who's on. I just didn't get in the bird kind and I've come here. And they were like, hmm, they let me in eventually. But at that point, you're right though, because I didn't kick off. But if I'd kicked off with him, then they would have been like, that's why you didn't get in. But I yeah. didn't kick off. So I think that point you've made there is completely correct. And even the question they asked you, who's on? It's just a simple fit. Like it, that one question is my favorite question on the door. Because it's like, some if you, like a lot of a lot of the time people, for example, obviously someone like yourself, you know, you, you didn't know who was on because you, you went to Hoppetos because you knew it was going to be good, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but like some people just go to places and they don't actually know where they're going. Yeah, I was just kind of like, I think my lack of, Oh, come on, let me in. I was just like, oh man, just let me in. I don't know who's I don't know who's on, but I am you know, whatever. And he probably could tell, okay, this guy isn't, you know, gonna cause a kick uh, a fuss inside the club and and things like that. So we'll move on to some of the actual specific oh. questions now. Yeah. The first one is this is a fucking good question. What is the most beneficial mistake you've ever made? Um oh, that's a fucking great question. That the it is the most beneficial mistake I've ever made. Um, <laughs> losing my one. hard drives. Ah, good one. Every Why? time, every time I lose my hard drive of my youth, because there was there was a point where I'd say from 2013 when I first started making music up until 2018, I never owned a laptop, right? I couldn't afford one, right? And instead of getting a job, I just wanted to fucking bum it out basically and just do music every single day and just put everything into it and just live off the the scrapings but what would happen is every so often me being clumsy fucking stupid me like a little kid used to lose my hard drives all the time and when you haven't got a laptop and all your music is on one hard drive one usb and you lose it you have no music left but what would happen is every time i would have to restart it made me look for deeper deeper music and be more organized that's probably the biggest biggest and it's it still happened recently you know like obviously i've got a laptop now but one time I lost my hard drive and I had to redo all my record box playlists, but then it, I still had the music, but it allowed me to then filter it out again. So when that's, whenever you lose, like I've had a lot of people that's lost stuff. And at, at the time they're thinking it's the worst thing in the world and that's it, all their hard work's done. But the, the knowledge that you've gained will never die, you know, and then you just use that and put it in and start again. Yeah, I think that's a very good one. Yeah, it's when you kind of lose something, but it opens up the path for something else in general. You know, when you lose something straight away, you're like, oh, no. But then usually it results in you finding a solution, sometimes more efficient solution or a better solution or a fresh slate. So next one is, what does it mean to play for you and me slash hide and seek? What does it mean? Yeah, what does it mean to you to play for you and me and hide and seek? You know what? You, you and me and hide and seek, especially are both parties that, you know, I didn't play the first ones or first, say you and me the first loads first. It's, is this the first time I've played a proper you and me party? On, on yeah, we'll talk music. briefly about the the kind of spontaneous yeah. and, um, one we had. And hide and seek again. There were both parties that I looked at and be like, oh mate, I really like to play it one day, and you know, and just put the work in. And then hide and seek's a great example as well because it was it was a case of the first time I played the after party, then I played the dome at an early time, then I played the dome at a later time, and it, and it's just that that hard work and progression, you know? So when you really want something and you put everything into it, the only thing you can get is, is good results back, you know? Yeah, I believe you said something to Zach, didn't you? Like, I'm going to play in the domain next year, the first year at Iron Seek, and then the following year you played. Yeah, yeah I remember there was, do you know what's funny? It was, um, so DMC, Danny Mac, at the time I didn't know him. And I, I remember being in the dome and someone was on before and I weren't really feeling it. Uh, but I love the dome, right? And next for you, though, this, this geezer's just come walking on with his long blonde hair, and I think he had sunnies on at the time. <laughs> Obviously, I was about to do it in Scouse, but I couldn't hear him because he was so far back. But And he just played this tune, and it was so good, and I took a video of it on my phone, and um, finally going back to the whole video situation, yeah. you know? Took a video of it on my phone, you know, and then put the phone away. I was like, who's this guy? We need to get him booked in London, you know? And then it just turns out that he knew all of my mates, you know, and then I was like, right, I need to experience that moment. I just experienced on the dance floor. I want to experience that from the other side of the decks at one point, you know, and obviously then it works. It just so happened to be that next year I ended up playing the dome, you know? Yeah. So that was hide and seek. And then obviously you and me, we did have uh, one small back to back because we had during the COVID times, I can't believe this was actually a thing. They did the parties in pens. 
they did the parties and it was in the pens of like six people and we were <laughs> i'm sure that was when it was like you know thinking yeah. back now i know there's the whole conspiracy thing which i'm not going to go into but yeah. it is fucking crazy when you think back to like they're like right you've got to have a mask on in a fucking pen um but then obviously the police came and shut it down unlawfully and then we ended up doing a very nice party in the middle of nowhere in Wilmslow, which is something that I bet you never expected. No, I didn't. And you know what? It was fucking sick as well. It, that was I, I still I still think about that time. When I thought about New Year's, I was thinking about that. Yeah, um, it, was a, it was a lot of fun, man, because we literally just played only vinyl. And I think we played for about five hours in the middle of nowhere with a generator to maybe 30 odd people, which is probably going to be something that I reckon I'll remember to the day I finished DJing. <laughs> 100 percent, and it was such a beautiful day as well you had the sun setting a lot on the hill and it, it you know it's they're, they're the funny ones because you there's always that fear of is it going to get shut down is it not going to get shut down you know and really it's just like it's just mates playing music in the field it's crazy so when we look ahead to new year's day there's been quite a lot of questions about preparation etc how do you tend to tackle back-to-backs and specifically new year's day have you got a game plan in mind as I'm actually shocked how fast it's coming round, and with it being a very big room, I know I'll be preparing a certain way with a few tricks up the sleeve. What do you tend to do when it's the the big occasions like that? Um, I mean, I don't know. I feel like every gig I kind of prepare for, um, the not so bigger gigs, I kind of just use them as practice to prepare for the bigger gigs. You know, like let's say for. For example, uh, the weekend just gone, I had, where did I, I played in uh, Milan on the Friday, on the Wednesday, because they had a bank holiday. Um, and then it was, and then I had a last minute gig as well on the Thursday after Campo Silly. But, and then I had this fabric on the Saturday. That was for me the big gig, back to about you and you in for the first time in room one. So I kind of use Milan as the, the the guinea pig, you know, not but guinea pig for new tunes. So what I do is I go away. I always like to look for new tunes, you know, no matter how much music I got, I always think I haven't got enough, you know. And it's always nice playing new music out that you've just discovered because you. But what I really like to do when it comes to preparing for tunes is actually prepare quite close to the time. Because what I find is the mood that I'm in now, you know, and it might be based on the weather, it might be based on how I'm feeling, it might be based on just situations going around me, is not necessarily the mood that I'm going to be in on the 1st of January 2023. So as much as like I can sit here and prepare for that gig now, I like to be as close to that point in time as possible when it comes to preparing my music because then I know I'm in that mind state. Because what I find is one, I can listen to a track now, you know, and then next month I listen to that same track and I'm not feeling it as much. And not because I'm not feeling the track, because I might listen to it another month later and be feeling it more than I was in the first place. But it's just me and how I'm resonating with the vibrations that I'm hearing, you know? So when it comes to preparing music um, for any gig, it's normally just before the gig. And I, like it might be on the way to the gig and I'm sitting there, I'm digging new music and going through different labels, different artists. Okay, I'm on a, I'm, I'm on more than old school tech house vibe now. I'm going to just dig as far, as far deep as I can using the knowledge I already know and get as much to the surface as possible. And then this is my base, you know, and then I'm just going to play it by ear in the night. And then when it comes to the back-to-backs, it's, it's the same. But then, you know, it's, you've got, you've kind of got your vibe, but then you're, it's not, I'm going to play this and, and it's like, a, I'm going to play better than that person. It's no, it's, I'm listening out to what that person's playing. And then, okay, so I can hear some sounds that remind me of this track. Let me play this. That's the kind of preparation that goes through my head. Yeah. It's got to be a fusion of the two, not a, you know, oh, let's try and outdo each other. Otherwise it just <laughs> spirals into fun. a big mess. Yeah, no, man. I've, I've had them back-to-backs where it's like, you know, you're playing a tune and like you're looking at the other person like, why are you bringing it in already? It's only been going for two minutes. Like, you know, like when I play back-to-back with you, for example, I fucking love it because the only time that we ever talk about, you know, bringing a track in is when he's like, or I'm like, oh, you can bring it in early if you want. And other than that, it's like, let the music do the talking. You know, you, you've got that trust in the other person. So you don't have to worry about any, you don't have to worry about what track they're picking. Uh, you don't have to worry about when they're going to mix it in. And then you can fully relax and be calm. And I think they're the best back-to-backs where you work as a team and you both understand that you're there to do the exact same job, you know, and I think even for the crowd, it 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 like 
um, like a lot of people think that when when for example there's two people playing back to back and one person's better than the other that the crowd are, are thinking oh yeah well oh that person's better but no they're just thinking that didn't work yeah. you know they're not thinking that one person is better than the other they're just like this isn't flowing whereas when you do something that's flowing it's like you know there's a there's a mutual respect and it just it's just better for everyone I think time helps though. Like we've got three and a half hours on New Year's Day. So there is no rush whatsoever. And I think that does help a lot because if there is two hours, one person may feel, right, we need to get this party started. The other person might be like, oh, we've got plenty of time. Two hours is a weird one, for example, because I never quite know. Have I got enough time here to build it? Do we need to go full power? But whereas like three and a half hours, it's quite clear that, okay, we've got time to get into it, kind of see where the night's going, see the energy, et cetera. And then you can build it that way. So I think time plays a big factor as well. Yeah, no, hundred percent, man. Times are massive. Like the, the 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 length of time you have for a set is always a, again that even when it comes to in, individual sets, it's a massive part of of the track selection because, like you said, you you've got time to take people on a journey, you know. Um, and also the, another one of the biggest things is communication, you know. Uh, and this this comes to back to backs and solo sets. What one of the biggest things that I used to do, um, which is something I don't do now, and I feel like it's a big advantage, is take the headphones off. Yeah, I speak about this like, all the time. Put them down. Put like them down. And look around. Have a drink. You know, yeah. like some because sometimes what happens, especially when you're just using CDJs, you know, like so quick. Like I can, you know. It takes me five seconds to get the track in time. If that, I can do it without headphones. It's got a fucking number on it. You know, yeah. it's so easy with, with your CDJs, yeah? So it's like, instead of, instead of like spending all your time pretending that, you know, you're playing, you're using the EQs, it's like, fucking leave the EQs alone. That person is sat in the track, sat in the studio for X <laughs> amount of time, making sure that that track sounds good at every moment in time. So stop playing with it and let the track do the talking, for one. Number two, everyone here is here listening to music. So why don't you just put the headphones down for two seconds and be be with them? It doesn't have to be forever, you know, but what I find is the power of taking the headphones off and actually being in the party allows you to continue the vibe because a lot of people make the mistake of keeping the headphones on and they're hearing the track that they're mixing in. And it probably sounds, and it sounds good. It does sound good, you know? And you're like, oh shit, I can bring this in now or I can do this. But what you're forgetting is the people that are dancing ain't hearing that. All they're hearing is what's coming out the speaker. So it's what I find is such an important thing to take them headphones off. And before you even think about mixing that track in is actually getting the vibe that you're already in. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, it's funny, right? I tell myself this thing, so uh, Diet Sandrom is one of my biggest inspirations. Mm -hmm. And I always say to myself, I've never, ever seen him rush a mix. Never. And right, when I get a bit agitated, I might bring this in. Sometimes I remember, go, right, Diet's never rushed a mix. And, like <laughs> we speak, I spoke to Gene once and he was like, yeah, I've never seen Evan Baggs mix a record out of time. He said that as well. And it's just, you know, about this big patience thing of like, right, who are my favorite DJs? What would they do? And sometimes just putting yourself in someone else's shoes. They don't rush the mixes. So why should I? You know, and I think that is a big thing with the pros. They take the time. Corolla, for example, he lets the tune play to the last drop and the last drop is the one that goes off the most. You know, when it comes in again, yeah. I think it's easy, easy when you're the guy mixing to think, oh, the tune's now been bought, got a bit, you know, repetitive. Let's bring something else in. But when you're in the crowd, that last breakdown, I am so guilty of bringing it in too quick. I know I am. But that last drop is the one which goes off the most. And it's, yeah, taking them off. That's why having a cigarette's good, having a drink, you know, chilling, even chatting to someone next to you, like someone there, uh, you know, and then going again, the next record. Mate, look at Villa Vill Vill is, is like the complete opposite. It, it, it put their headphones off from, from the majority of it. But you know what? <laughs> For me, it's 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 not so much like not listening to it because like you have to you have to have, no you have to be it's a confidence thing as well. And over time you learn when you learn in your in yourself how long it takes you to mix in a track, you know, some more than others. But what you just said there about uh looking up to the people you respect, that's where I learned. I learned I learned more about letting tracks play out. Which, you know what I learned the most is when I played back to back with you in at Gotwood. And I was like, why is this guy letting the track play to like the last 30 seconds every time? And then it was like, let me try it. And it was like, oh my God, it flowed so much better because it was like... The elements aren't clashing. The, the way the tunes are made, the elements are coming in and out, then everyone's outros have got less elements. So naturally, the mix is 10 times easier. So you essentially need less skill 
to mix an outro into another track coming in, but it sounds better. So yeah. it's kind of a bit of a... And, it, and then the key point I want to make here, just so, so it's very clear, is that one of my pet hates when it comes to listening to people or playing with people is when people are like mix every single track the same like they have a method of mixing you know let's say the most standard and, and and standard way that i see is when the bass turns down the 32 to 32 the bass yeah. turns down on the track you're bringing in the track comes up that bass goes down and this bass goes up for me the reason why i don't like it is because you should want number one you should know your music you know you should know how that track sounds from start to finish and you should be mixing the track in and mixing the track out in the best possible way. So let's say, for example, there's high frequencies on the right on the track on the right that are, you know that are really catching the groove, you know. And on the left, the high frequencies maybe are going to be clashing with the one on the right. So when you're bringing that track in, blend the high frequencies. You know, you could you could start with the bass in. You know, a lot of people have this fear, you know, the low end of both tracks playing. I mean, really, if on one of the tracks, you know, the, the, the low end frequencies are looking between like, you know, say 80 to 120 hertz and the other one, like you know, 120 to, to 150, for example, you're not actually, it's not going to be muddy, you know, and to have, and it's all about balancing out. The, the frequencies to be able to create new grooves and new sounds within the two rather than just having a, a standard flat method of mixing and the best way to do it is by knowing your music and knowing what sounds good you know okay you've got a track but at, at, for the first five seconds the bass is, is it catches sick it's learning when learning how to catch the groove in the track and that's what i feel keeps a mix flowing because then you you get playful with it, you know. There's there's tracks that I, I will literally like bring this track in and then chop that out straight away because I know that there's, a, there's an in, there's an yeah. impactful stab or an impactful something, and you're kind of using each track to bounce off each other rather than just using a standard method of mixing in and out. And I think what that comes from is not having enough confidence in your beat matching. Um, Because it used to happen to me, you know, you used to worry too much about is it in time rather than is it staying, is 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 the energy staying high? And what what can happen is you you focus way too much on is it in time, and you and then you you don't even think about am I keeping the energy high? You know? Yeah, I agree, man. Uh, Something I say is you can tell when someone's quite new to DJing because they leave the bass out a lot. And you only know, pull bass out on two things, it really, really loses the energy. And that's something that, yeah, the, the whole mixing side of things, if you can get things in time more seamlessly, you can spend more time then creating the vibe with, you know, blending EQs, et cetera. But yeah, man, I think everything you've said there is, is completely on point. Next question we've got here is, how do you balance work, doing, family, fitness, digging, production, life, et cetera? So the question there is literally, how do you find balancing the various things right. in life if someone's got the answers to that let me know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i mean look for me it comes from you know i haven't got that balance right just yet and it's and you know uh for example i've yesterday i just got back from a family meal with my mum who i haven't seen for god knows how long because of my birthday and it was so hard organizing a meal before because especially this year this year it's changed my life has changed so much this year because i'm not i'm not used to playing I wasn't used to playing every single weekend, you know? I was used to being like, oh, my God, I've got three gigs in a row. Now I'm like, oh, my God, I've got a weekend off, you know? And for me, the busy period started in the summer and in the festivals. So it wasn't go to a gig on a Saturday and get home a bit busted on on the Sunday night, Monday. It was go to a festival on the Thursday, get home on the Tuesday, and then on the Wednesday, I'm I'm recovering, but I'm also prepping to go to the next festival on Thursday. And it was like, you know, such a mental summer. Um, and and everything did go a bit out of balance. But I think the key thing is is learning when you have drifted too far apart and then understanding that, accepting that, and doing whatever you need to do to pull it back. You know, it might be, okay, I've got a weekend off, but I'm not gonna go out. That's when I'm gonna do this stuff, you know, because you're you as a DJ, you learn that you're your weekends become your weeks, you know, the time where you have off to do 
relaxing stuff might be the Wednesday and the Tuesday, but then you've also got admin stuff to do, you know? And I think obviously the busier you get, that's when you do start employing people to do certain stuff for you. You know, it might be your social media. It might be, um, you know, just like, for example, that's why when I first started DJing, I was like, I don't want an agent. I don't want to, I don't want a manager because I, I know exactly what I want to do. I know where I want to go, you know? And, but then you realize that you, you haven't got the time and the capacity to do everything, especially the busier you get, you know? And, um, I think the most important thing is understanding your human, you know, and understanding that you need to eat, your mind needs to be healthy, your, your body needs to be healthy, you know, to be able to, what I find is that the more healthy my mind and my body is, the better music I make and the better sets that I play. And when you kind of, go with that attitude, you know, it might be just little things like, you know, getting up and going for a run, you know, it might just it might be something as simple as meditating. But I think the more you give yourself and the more you give your body, the the better focus you, you will be. And I, I find that even with music, my, like Jay, I was speaking, I had a good combo with Jamie, uh, just jam, Jamie Mannion the other day. And he was, he was talking about progressing music. And I said to him, I said, mate, I'll be honest. Some of my biggest leaps in progression with music haven't been practicing music. It's been improving as a human, you know, improving and growing as a man. And I feel like the more you actually grow as a person, the more powerful and the, the you know, the more balanced your career will be. Yeah, I think to take a different angle on this, I was listening to something interesting today and it's we must choose our regrets. So here we spoke about different things like work, family, fitness, digging, production, we can choose to do something, but by choosing to do something, something else has to give. And it's, we've got to regret something. So, you know, playing that extra long set at the weekend, if you didn't do that, you may have regretted it. But then after it, you may regret the hunger you've now got. But there's always going to be a regret with all these things. And it's mm -hmm. choosing what you think you'll regret the least, you know, for the, different, to look at the different avenues. But yeah, it's, it's a really interesting way to look at it. So the next question, Reese, we'll, we'll keep the camera on you while mine's off. Oh. It is... Who is your biggest motivation at the moment? At the moment, myself. I think, I'll be honest, not even in a big head way. It's just, um, like someone said it to me not so long ago. They was like, who's, who's, which DJs you concentrating on? Who do you want to play on a lineup with? And I was like, you know what? I don't want to concentrate on anyone else right now but myself. You know, because I've got to that stage where it's, I'm at like the exploration stage, should you call it, you know, I'm exploring myself, you know, I'm exploring my sound, I'm exploring where I want to go, I'm exploring where I want to be. And I feel like when you when you focus too much on other people, you know, I feel like you 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 subconsciously betray, you become them. You get distracted. You know, rather, exactly. And distracted. And I think um, I actually really just want to focus on myself right now. Um and I feel like if there's, there isn't like a specific person or group of people or, you know, organization, which I'm like, I want to be like that. I just literally want to concentrate on myself right now. Yeah. I think there's been a huge shift in being able, be, being able to be independent in this thing now, whereas it used to be, you had to rely on the label, had to rely on PR. And this is the power of social media as well. The fact we can now promote ourselves, market the things we're doing and yeah, be inspired by ourselves and not have to put these people on a pedestal. As much as respect we have for the the ones above us, I do think there is a slight shift coming in lots of upcoming artists, et cetera. But yeah, I think yeah. By, by aspiring for them, big labels, you can often get distracted. And I found it where I'm like, oh, maybe I should change this in this track to try and fit this kind of sound and all this kind of stuff. Then when I play it in the club, it fucking goes off anyway. So yeah, sticking to the guns and not getting that's it, mate. Distracted. So we've got some quick fire ones here, man. So um first one, fave club and why. Oh, favorite club. At the moment after Capofilo, I'd say. I yeah, I think the same. I think Shelter comes in close second, and then obviously yeah. Fabric's up there as well. I think there's just something, you know, the sound, the crowd, the people behind the scenes for all of them as well it's not just the club itself the way they run the atmosphere it goes deep yeah it's a fact it's a it's a fact it's the family thing like I, when I, I spoke to enzo about it when we, when we were there last week and i said to him 
does this come because I does this come close to Fuse at ninety three? Is that mate? This is the only thing that compares to Fuse at ninety three, and yeah. it's just it's that family vibe, you know. People travel from all. It's in Venice, but people literally every single Sunday travel from all around of Italy, driving three, four, five, six hours sometimes, just to go to this place because they know they're going to know the people there. The music's going to be amazing. The sound system is amazing, and everything is just there done for the love, you know. Yeah. So this one is a. This is probably the best question. Well, my favorite one. If artists had stocks, who would you put who would you put your money on to 10x your investment? Oof. It would have to be oh, that's a great one. <laughs> uh my man Wada. I, I had a feeling you'd say him, man. He's, I see he's, he's my, doing some good shit. Yeah, he's one of my favorite producers up and coming. And he's such, and like, forget the music. As a person, he's such a nice guy. So if you're listening to this, Wada, um, thank you, mate. Uh, it was lovely to meet you this year. And just keep pushing, mate, because you're going to go far. Yeah, funnily enough, funnily enough, mine is Paddy Lee, and them two have been making tunes together. And Paddy's okay. bought, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a funny, it's a good stock to invest in. <laughs> We're going to do the next back to back at you and me, watch. Yeah, I think there's good things, <laughs> there's good things happening there. Paddy sends me voice notes every day he reminds me of myself and i was similar age to him relentlessly making music the quality just keeps getting better and better because he's making so much music and yeah he's a fucking good guy as well so paddy fair play mate um then in general um favorite up up and coming artists so is there any others you can name um, maybe pick five pick five five right so you've got uh locky uh harry Feltz, um stan a lot of them three you know, they play together, but do it as a three. And you got Wada, obviously, I, I had him in there as well. Another up and coming artist. Uh, as a a guy called Brandon, Brandon Hampshire, Hamps, he DJs under. He was actually, when I, when I was doing lessons last year, he was one of my students. And then since then, we've just become really good mates. And he's actually, uh, he does his own party. Um, and he's got his first BU gig coming up as well on the 27th of December. Which, which he's really buzzing about. Nice. So we'll link them below. The people I'll shout out is obviously Paddy, Ed Hodge, who is released on You and Me, is doing fucking good shit. Jake Scott, who's recently sent me an EP, and obviously Jensen and Local Dub. I still think enough, enough people, and not enough people, sorry, um, are aware of them guys. But yeah, some good names there. What sort of artists are you listening to at the moment outside of electronic music? Uh, that's a good oh, point. I actually, I listen to more outside than, than I, I listen to more music outside literally probably now than I do electronic music. Um, and it's probably, uh, Krangbin. I listen to a lot. Uh, that's how you say it, right? Um, who else? And a lot of, um, I listen to a lot of hip hop uh mainly old school hip-hop not quite new stuff uh little sims a lot, a lot of uk music you know there, there was a big rise in i'm gonna call it conscious uk music you know because there's a lot of uk music outside of electronic music which is all about guns drugs money um you know things that don't interest me should i say and but you know there was a time where you had your your, your Erica Badu's, your Lauren Hills, your you know, and that era of of artists kind of seemed to fade away for a long time. But recently, there's been you know this wave of artists. You know, I'm not saying they've only just come around now; they, they've been putting in the work for years. But now they're getting the credit that they deserve. You know, uh, Little Sims especially like that. She's got an album uh, which is. Um, I put it on record upstairs, but I heard it for the first, I heard her at Glastonbury, you know, and I, I've, I've heard the name before, but it was just the lyrics and it gives me the motivation to, to, to really keep going because it's like um, everything that I believe in, in, in regards to what you put out, what you put out, you get back and, you know, just there's something bigger. There's something bigger in this life than what meets the eye in this 3D world, you know? That's the kind of music that I like listening to. Something that that makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, and podcasts. So a tech one, just name three. What are the most used plugins when Laidlaw's in the studio? Stylus, 
Trillion and Omnisphere all spectronics. <laughs> Man, I have made I have made Trillion and Omnisphere spectronics. I reckon I've made them at least five hundred sales, at least. And I, I need to get some kind of uh affiliate link. If you're listening to this, guys, you definitely owe me a lot of uh royalties. <laughs> Top three UK venues. Uh fabric. Um Mint. Mint for sure. Fabric Easy. mint. Um, I'm gonna say Fabric Mint in the Loft. Um, okay. You know, Fabric because it's my favorite venue in London in regards to the community, the sound system, the the family there. Uh, Mint, same again, the family. You know, and same with the Loft. These are venues that whenever I go, every time I've gone there, is the same experience. You know, I feel at home, and I feel free. A question off the cuff. Is there any hidden gems in the UK that you played at? Like just clubs you wouldn't have any idea of in these little cities or anything like that? Anything that comes to mind? Yeah, there's this venue called I don't even want to I don't even want to speak about it too much, but it's one of the venues you it's so you won't be able to find it. It's just called 17. But I played there. I when I played there, it's only small, it's like 80 capacity. And it is the best sound system I've ever played on in my life. It's custom built, all made out of wood. And the booth looks like this massive spaceship. Um, and it's one of them venues that I played there all night long. And it's, I think they, they do it on a Thursday. And um, maybe there's a few people listening to this podcast that know what I'm talking about. It's just called number. It doesn't have a page. It doesn't have a name. It's just number. Is it in London? Yeah, it's in London. Oh, wow. Um, you know. And uh, they do events there every Thursday. And it's like, it, it was like a dream come true to play in that system. Like, honestly, it was like, you can just hear every little detail. It's the only system in London, well, only booth in London that's probably clearer than fabric. Is there a booking that you've had that you believe changed your path as an artist? Um, I think there's been many. I think there hasn't been one specifically. There's been, like, I can pinpoint a few bookings, for example, now that have, like, changed uh, the trajectory of and the speed of my career. Yeah. I think, obviously, one of them, say, was my, the first time I played for Infuse. Uh, another one was the, Inf the Infuse Animal Crossing. I thought park. you were going to say that one. I remember that one. I remember seeing the videos, which is funny exactly. about the, the phone thing. People, like, there's a yeah. few sayings that in 2022 or 2021, should I say, was the common saying that everyone would say to me. And be like, oh, I saw that video of you with the colored windows, right? Yeah, that, yeah. If I if I had a pound for every time I heard that, I'd be honestly, I'd be bored. Um, <laughs> and, and do you know what's another thing that I hear people say to me all the time, funnily enough, is... I listen to your podcast with just Baker. Ah, <laughs> funny man. Um, but yeah, going back to the gig. So you got that on that. The Gotwoods. Uh, that was a huge one for me. Because uh, it was like, you know, one of the first like date long festivals in a while. Their first one back after two years. My first camping festival for ages. And, it, um, you know, ended up being a lot. Uh, I think it was meant to be. Originally, it was meant to be like me. Ewan, Rarish, and then Margaret Digas, and then I think Rarish couldn't make it or something. Then it was like me me for a bit, then Ewan for a bit, and then back to back, and then Margaret would end up being late, and we ended up playing this like long extended set. And it was just an incredible day. Um, you know, and it for me it was um it was nice because obviously I went back back to back with someone who at the time was an artist that I'd really looked up to. Obviously I still do now, but now it's become a, a person that's just my mate, you know. Um, so as a, as I learned, I learned a lot from that back to back, you know, and I feel like back to backs when you, when you treat them right, um, you can learn so much, you know, and it's the same with like sitting down with someone in the studio, you know, when you, when you go in there with the intention to learn and to progress, you, you get the most from it. Um, and also I'd say the Australian, the, the last two would Sash, be the Australia yeah. gig. Um, because it was like the first time that I properly toured, you know, and when I say toured, I mean, you go to the gig, you go, you, you, you get off the plane, you go to a hotel, you go to the meal, you go to the gig, you get, 
then you go back to the hotel and you got to get up and you got to go to the plane and you go to the it's, it's fucking like hectic. non-stop and you're like everyone was like how was Australia I was like yeah the hotel was nice the plane was nice but like I didn't <laughs> see much of it <laughs> yeah the same you know, here, man. you learn how to deal with that you know and then the third the final one I'd say was Peru and it was the same again but it was doing that in a country which was different you know uh, I, I was quite lucky that I can actually speak a little bit of Spanish, but it was certain points where, you know, I was thinking if I didn't speak Spanish, this would be a whole new experience, you know? Um, and yeah, just being, traveling the world through co- being cultured. And I feel like not only has it changed my career, it's changed me as a person, which has then in turn changed my career. It's allowed me to come back with a calmness and and, and more of a focus, you know? Because when you, when you start seeing rewards you you know you can either go two ways you can either be like yeah i've made it you know so like i've done what i want to do or you can be like right now i need to work even harder i need to focus even more you know and going back to what you said at the beginning uh, a little while ago about balance that is what made me realize that i need to really sh- shift the balance you know because it it wasn't so much about like it was a point a couple months ago where i weren't like right i i want to you know do better i want to play more gigs it was no I want to maintain the balance that I've got with work and family and this and I know that is what's going to allow me to get more gigs because that's what's going to give me longevity you know yeah yeah I agree man so we'll we'll bring the podcast home it's been great to talk to you and for anyone listening we will be playing back to back for three and a half hours after dungeon meet at new century hall in Manchester on new year's day I'm very much looking forward to it man have you got anything else to add any comments or anything like that um, you know, I just want to really, um, what's the word I'm trying to use? Uh, go back to the point you said about, cause you said something which really, I, I, I wanted to say it and you literally took the words out of my mouth and it was just about, if you really want to learn more as well, as well as going back to the history of music, it's also just listen to the people that have been doing this for ages, you know? Like um, what you just said there about, it's funny, playing with Tristan and Balfour, like Tristan and Balfour again, like people... You know, oh, five, ten years ago, it was like really looking up to, him. and now, you know, it's got. To, I've seen Tristan so many times and learned so much of him. You know, we're now really good mates now. But again, every time I'm with him, it's like soaking up knowledge. Be a sponge, know? man. Be a sponge of everyone. This is it. It's like people like Tristan haven't been around for so long because because they're a good DJ. You know, they've been around because they're a good DJ because they're a good person and they're here. Their intentions are pure. You know, and they're they're here for the right reasons so listen to these people you know and and actually understand what you're doing you're not just going out and partying or you're not just making music you know you're you're creating something and and remember that awesome reese thank you very much bro this will be on digital audio the usual things i will see you very soon and in the meantime take it easy man and we need to get a studio session booked in yes that should be for january that january thank you very much for your time mate Peace, bro. See you soon, man. Big love, boys.